Hello everyone, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Adrian Lloyd, this is Just My Stupid Opinion. And I'm very happy to say that I finally got my gear for the podcast. Got myself my hat, and my hoodie, and my shirts, and I'm good to go now. So yeah, the mix-up that happened with the UPS is apparently they didn't have my apartment number, so they couldn't deliver and I had to go pick it up on Monday. No problem, no complaints here, I'm very happy with what I got. As you can see, I got a JMSO podcast hat, or at least those watching on YouTube can see. Any audio viewers will have to go watch will have to go watch the video if they want to see it. I also got my sweater, JMSO podcast, get mad about it. And then finally, I got this is one of two shirts. So I'm very happy about it. So yeah, as you can probably see, I'm very happy about it. I spent a lot of money in order to get this custom made, so... And the thought of it may, may have possibly having to get sent back to the States because I didn't have a, an apartment number really sucked. But everything worked out, and I can finally do my first podcast with all my gear. My mic stand, my chair, and my clothes. And as much as I love my beautiful clothes, we have to get a little in a little bit closer, though, because that's just a little bit too far away. So today I'm coming at you with a few different stories. We're going to be talking a little bit about what's been going on with the Washington Post. It seems that uh, Project Veritas, who you probably heard before, they did the undercover expose on CNN. They ended up hitting up Washington Post. That didn't go over as well as they had hoped, so we're in a bit of a situation. We're going to be talking about that. Uh, We're going to be talking about Bill Morneau again. Every time I think I'm out, they pull me back in. Because, uh, well, he got hammered hard in question period by Pierre Polyev, the conservative uh, finance critic. He got hammered on Monday, this past Monday, very hard in Parliament, and then again on Tuesday. But this time, uh, Bill Morneau's threatening legal action if they continue, if they continue criticizing him over this. We'll get into that more. If we have time, we'll end off talking about ISIS brides who apparently have returned in order to recruit the next generation of future soldiers to join the caliphate. If I don't get to talk about that on this podcast, I will most certainly be talking about that on the next one. But I'd like to start off today with doing a bit of a response video. I want to do a bit of a response to a PragerU video. Um, PragerU University is a YouTube channel that puts out a lot of right-wing, pro-capitalist, pro-religion videos. And this one is actually a couple years old, this one, but but recently PragerU on Twitter has been tweeting out all of their uh, old videos in order to get people to watch them again. So this was one that got tweeted out over the last couple days, and I figure that if they're going to try and inspire new people in order to watch it, then... Perhaps we should do a response video to it. I don't believe this is one that uh, a lot of people have done before. So the video is called, Does Science Argue For or Against God? And it's just quite simply about that. So I figure that if he's going to be bringing up all these old videos, then we're going to be discussing them. I think one vi- the video that Prager used put out that has been responded to the most by the atheist community was this one where... Um, I believe the title was called Without God There Is uh, No Murder, and he pretty much argues that that murder was established by God and therefore that, and the fact that God dictates that murder is wrong. If you don't believe in God, then murder is just an opinion, which, big problems with that one, but that one's been done to death, so I didn't want to bother with that one, and I do believe that was one that got tweeted out again recently. But yeah. This one is, in my opinion, overlooks many different factors and is just an oversimplification, so we're going to get into it. And better yet, I'm very excited, I get to bring back a segment that I haven't had a chance to use in a long time. So I'm very happy to bring back the hitch slap. It's been, I think, months since I've had the chance to use it again. And for those who haven't seen my other segments with hitch slap, which I think I only did one, possibly. Uh, I didn't do, uh, I rolled it out and then I didn't have a chance to use it again. 
but the point of the hitch slap this segment of the show of the podcast is to just like hitchens did in life the point is to use rational arguments to take down religious points but i don't want to prattle on too long so without wasting any more time let's get right into it In 1966, Time Magazine ran a cover story asking, Is God Dead? The cover reflected the fact that many people had accepted the cultural narrative that God is obsolete. That first off, the whole God is Dead thing was actually first put forth by uh, Nietzsche. And his, in this book, he was theorizing about how humanity would act without God. Nietzsche was an atheist, but he seemed to believe that um, the church and the Christian faith seemed to, first off, he believed that it um, civilized the Europeans for being the warmongering race that they were. And on top of that, he theorizes that with the, with the rise of secularism and the decline of Christianity and religion, he theorized that there was going to give rise to a moral relativity, which he turned out to be right on, but this is really what he's making reference to with, that, with uh, God is Dead on Time magazine. That's more just a little insight rather than a response. That as science progresses, there's less need for a god to explain the universe. But getting into the response, god obsolete, in some regards, yes. In the scientific empirical community, it's not good to look and take the Bible and religion with under serious eyes because this can really blind you to what the truth is in the world how things are because that's the point of science the science it tells us you know what things are made up with what is there what what are they so this is the point of science so if we're moving to a more objective empirical world like how we're looking at the world as it is then god is getting obsolete and God kind of is obsolete, in my opinion, in the empirical world, trying to say that God created the earth, that we are, you know, a member, a, you know, we are descendant of Adam and Eve, trying to say this at, with all seriousness, with trying to push it in the scientific community, is a bad idea because it doesn't stand up to the actual empirical evidence. So in many ways, God is obsolete. However, if we're talking about in the personal life, then I'm sure there are, the argument gets a little more entangled there, and then that's where things get complicated. But if we're talking about in the scientific, empirical world, then yes, the idea of God as he is, is obsolete. It turns out, though, that the rumors of God's death were premature. In fact, perhaps the best arguments for his existence come from, of all places, science itself. I think you're looking in the wrong place for God, bud. Even many Christians themselves, some rational Christians, some rational Christian scientists, they'll admit that you can't go looking into science in order to find proof for God. In fact, if you go looking into science itself, then you're actually putting yourself in a tough place because that's where you're going to get torn down. In fact, all the progress in destroying the narrative that God created the world and the universe has been done through scientific purposes. So you're really looking in the wrong area for this, especially considering how many in the scientific community, because of what they look into and how they are charged with figuring out how the universe is and how the world is, when they look into it and compare it to the myths that come from the Bible, they can see that there is a big problem there when they say that God created the universe and then they see scientific evidence of different possibilities and the way that the world works then you're really, once again, looking in the wrong area. Many of these scientists spend their time pulling down the idea of God because it doesn't line up with the science. And for many of us, if you want, science is, it's an objective empirical evidence tool, if you know what I mean. Sort of like how, the, how Christians say that God means an objective morality. It's sort of the same thing with science. The science can't be circumvented. As long as the science is accurate and done properly, the science can't be circumvented. But I'll give you an opportunity. Let's see what you have to say about science proving God. Here's the story. The same year Time featured its now famous headline, the astronomer Carl Sagan announced that there were two necessary criteria for a planet to support life, the right kind of star and a planet the right distance from that star. 
given the roughly octillion planets in the universe, that's one followed by 24 zeros, there should have been about septillion planets, that's one followed by 21 zeros, capable of supporting life. First off, I'm not a guy to go against Carl Sagan, and he was absolutely right when he gave those two criteria. The problem is there's actually more that is required for a habitable planet than just the type of star and the distance from the, from the star. As we can take a look here, what makes a habitable planet? Well, it depends on the temperature, and this does depend on the star and the distance from the star for sure. We have water. Almost all life form, as we know it anyway, need water. This could be a different story depending the farther in the universe that we go because we don't know what weird stuff is out there or how many different life forms are out there. Unless we actually get boots on the ground, so to speak, such as rovers like we're doing on Mars, we can't be sure of what sort of life lives there and what sort of um, sustenance that, nice, that life needs to survive. But right now, as the criteria, water is definitely unnecessary. On most planets, though, you know, you'll find a big body of water if they're within the range that they're talking about. If it's an equal distance from the sun and it's uh, the star is appropriate, then you'll find a big body of water, usually. Atmosphere. Absolutely, you know, if you have a heavy ozone layer that tends to trap a lot of greenhouse gases in, well, then you're going to have a pretty hot surface. So this all depends as well. The energy, such as the chemical energy necessary to run their form of life. So humans, just like every other animal species, are reliant in some regard on the sun, but not nearly to the degree that our, um, our plant life is. Our plant life like needs sun to survive. With no sun, our plant life will die. So it all depends on the type of life form, without a doubt. And then nutrients. What is there in order for us to take in order to survive? So these are actually, there are actually more factors than Carl Sagan brought up. Now, once again, just saying that Carl Sagan said that, that doesn't prove or disprove anything. So we, let's move on a little farther in order to figure out what they're talking about. With such spectacular odds, scientists were optimistic that the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, known by its initials SETI, an ambitious project launched in the 1960s, was sure to turn up something soon. With a vast radio telescopic network, scientists listened for signals that resembled coded intelligence. But as the years passed, the silence from the universe was deafening. As of 2014, researchers have discovered precisely bubkis, not a zilch, which is to say zero followed by an infinite number of zeros. So a few things on this. First off, um, considering that it's PragerU and he's a Jewish man who pushes religion and says how important religion is, I find this a little interesting that he decides to take what I would consider a secular scientific argument, which has to do with there's other life forms and is trying, essentially he's trying to turn it on itself, which I think is a little funny because considering how, I find this a little funny because religious, uh, the religious narrative tends to say that that humans are God's children and therefore the most important life form in the universe. And they never actually say that there's no life form on another planet, but this is for a long time been the Bible passes a narrative that's been used in order to push that how important humans are, how valid humans are on in the universe. So the fact that he's trying to then take that and use it, the fact we haven't found any sort of life forms quite like that to justify that, uh, to justify his point of view about God, I find that a little bit funny. And the thing is, the other thing is, when they're talking about how scientists, uh, they put their radio away signals and aim them towards the sky, this is a very, very inefficient way of trying to make first contact for a few different reasons. Radio waves aren't necessarily strictly have to be man-made. And here's a good example is we've all heard of the wow signal, which was back about 40 years ago. Uh, scientists got a signal that came from space and they couldn't, it was a radio wave, and they couldn't figure out what it was. So what ended up happening is the scientist who copied down the radio wave, he ended up circling it and, um, and he wrote wow next to it, like on the paper when he copied everything down. 
So this is why it became known as the wow signal. Well, recently they believe that they discovered that this came from two comets that happened to be passing in that area. They discovered these two comets, traced their trails back to what had been in this area where this radio signal came from at the time and are pretty sure it came from them. Also, just pointing at the sky and firing away radio waves is again, very inefficient because the farther away they go from space, well, again, just the farther something is away, even if it looks close together, as soon as you get closer to it, it's much farther apart. If you're trying to do this to planets that are light years away, very inefficient. Not to mention that a radio wave in a vacuum can only travel the speed of light, which means that it's going to, and considering how our closest celestial cousin, our closest solar system to Earth is 4.5 light years away from us, that means before they could even get it, it would be 4.5 years. I believe it's 4.5, yeah, or four light years away. Then they would have to send that signal back to us at 4.5 light years. It would take another 4.5 light years in order to get home. They would also have to figure out that the signal came from us. If they even get it, they would have to have somebody there ready to listen, because that's also the other problem with the radio wave is once it comes in, unless it's being broadcast continuously, once it comes in, you'll hear it and then it's gone. So unless somebody has their microphone or their telescope post, uh, pointed in the right direction to receive that signal, you're not going to be heard. In fact, the other, the other thing is this doesn't prove intelligent life. What actually would be a much more, um, a better idea for proving that you are an intelligent life form would be to send a signal that would, with mathematical equations, mathematical solutions, send them blaring music, because this would signify that it is an intelligent life form that is reaching out to you. This would not just come naturally, this could not just come as a ready away from a comic, but if you are sending math solutions that are solved, that would prove that there is intelligence out there. And just to take it a little bit farther too, because I figure that if you were to break down this part of the argument, the other part of the argument would be that they would go to say that, well, we also haven't had any intelligent life that has visited us. Well, there's a few problems about aliens coming here too. For one good one would be aliens, if they were actually to make a traveling to Earth to try and make contact, they would have to solve the problem of distance, the problem of fuel, the problem of food. Depending how long it is, they may have to de determine the problem of age. And that's before they even get here and they have to worry about, you know, making contact in language that both species can understand. It also doesn't take into account about the, the spread of germs. Don't forget, back in the day when um, the conquistadors made contact with the natives of the New World, they had, weren't used, their immune systems weren't used to uh, the germs, and this is what caused the outbreak. It wasn't actually, like many people say, it was a germ warfare. It was an accidental uh, contamination, and it turned into an outbreak. And this is very possible if we're having visitors from another planet. They could have a type of disease that we don't know about. Maybe they're immune to the disease, but we wouldn't because our immune systems have never known it. So we have to t they would have to take that into consideration. There's plenty of things about why it would not be efficient to go to another planet. And believe me, I love my Star Trek too, but it's not realistic. Also, I believe it was Einstein who theorized that a, uh, an object of mass cannot travel faster than the speed of light. He was, I believe this was also when he was theorizing that the faster the speed of light you go, the slower, uh, the slower time travels. But you can't actually travel faster than the speed of light as an object. You can't have an engine that pushes a object of mass faster than the speed of light. So even if they could almost get up to the speed of light, they would still have the problem of distance because our close, like I said, our closest relative, which is Alpha Centauri, is 4.5 uh, light years away, which means even if they're traveling at almost the speed of light, it's still going to take them that time to get here. Now we take Einstein's theory into account and we take about human we take human technology into account how far we've progressed in, how far we've progressed in um, in space travel and just travel in general how fast we get places we've made a lot of improvements for a species but we have not made remotely close to intergalactic travel while there is possible species have mastered this again it's not efficient because if unless Einstein's theory is false and until it's proven false, we're taking it to be true, 
then nothing can travel that fast. And let's say that Alpha Centauri doesn't have the ability to support life, which I don't believe it would with the type of stars that they have because they have multiple stars. I think they got two, maybe three, um, like, sun stars in their solar system. Well, then we're just going farther out, and they have to travel farther in order to get here. So it doesn't really work. The only possible theory, that, as far as I can tell, that would possibly work for going to the speed of light or... Um, or faster would be the warp bubble theory. The warp bubble theory says that a ship is surrounded in a warp bubble. And what this does is the object itself doesn't actually, um, doesn't actually move at the speed of light, but the bubble travels through space. It's sort of like space and time move around it. That would be the theory, except that is just well, just that, it's just a theory, and it's also a flawed theory. There's a lot of gaps in that theory. It, it, whether that's even a possibility, we, it, is, we're nowhere close to even determining that. So this is why making contact with another species, an alien species, or an alien species coming to our planet wouldn't work. Or at least would be very, very difficult. And let's not forget, the, the universe is huge. The Milky Way galaxy alone is estimated to have 2 billion stars. Just stars. That's not let alone planets. And that's just in our galaxy. And we theorize there's about 100 billion galaxies in the universe right now. And, they're pop and we theorize that more are popping up every single day. But I find this guy is just using the argument of negatives. He's just saying, well, we haven't found anything yet, so therefore the science points more toward God because, well, we haven't made contact, so therefore it's less likely. It's a miracle that we're here, therefore it was God. That's a way oversimplification, especially a way oversimplification of the science. What happened? As our knowledge of the universe increased, it became clear that there were, in fact, far more factors necessary for life, let alone intelligent life, than Sagan supposed. His two parameters grew to 10, then 20, and then 50, which meant that the number of potentially life-supporting planets decreased accordingly. Yes, but the more factors we're involving, the less, the more minute they are. The factors that I showed and the factors that Carl Sagan theorized are the major factors that you need. While there are other factors that do make a difference, what we need to actually have is a planet that can support the life. The life has to find a way on its own, such as humans. We went through many factors that technically should have killed us off. Ice ages that should have killed us off, but here we are today. An ice age on another planet, we would just assume, well, then it can't support life. We survived. Other species survived. That's why I'm sticking with the main factors that I've put forward, which have scientifically always been the main factors as to what uh, goes into making a planet. These, you know, 10, 20, 50, these are sub-factors, if I can say that, if I can put it that way. They're not as significant, but they will help improve the chances of life. But, you, but the difference is, is that this guy is trying to present them as if without these factors, there cannot be life. That is absolutely not true. Right now, we're going all by statistics and probabilities. But instead, he's using the probabilities as an absolute. He's saying, because the probabilities say this, well, that means there is no life form. Or there is very minute, and we haven't found it. Therefore, the science points toward God. It does not, in any regard, point in that way. Because in order for the science to point that way, it has to actually show that it may have been made by creation. And we haven't proven that. Fuck, we've in investigated planet side only... Pretty much the only planets we have investigated are the planets in our solar system. We haven't branched out to any other solar system, but then at least this guy is taking the arrogant approach that because we haven't found anything, that means nothing's out there. The number dropped to a few thousand planets and kept on plummeting. A few thousand planets, I'm sorry, let me reiterate that. 200 billion stars in our solar system 100 billion galaxies in the universe 
a few thousand planets? Excuse me? The problem is here, too, is this guy is claiming to know more than the science is showing. Because one thing religious people like to talk up, uh, talk about these days is the arrogance of science. How science thinks it knows everything. Actually, that's where they're wrong. Because I hear scientists all the time saying, we don't know. We don't know. We theorize this. We think that. But on the other side, from the religious side, it's always, it's this. It's that. We know this. And this is exactly the type of narrative that this guy is pushing inside this video. He's saying, you don't know, therefore I am right. I saw this too, used against Bill Nye in 2013 when he debated Ken Ham at the creation. Uh, Kevin Ham. I can't, always want to call him Ken Ham, but Kevin Ham at the Creationist Museum. That was exactly what Ke Kevin Ham was saying throughout the whole debate, is that you don't know therefore I am right. Therefore, it shows that my position is right. No, it doesn't. It just shows that we don't know. From the rationalist side, the empirical side, is that we have a big problem with, say, with dealing in absolutes when we don't know for sure. We're not going to sit there and say, we know for a fact that alien life form is out there. But the probability of how big our universe is, how many stars, how many planets, how little we know about different types of life forms. We're still even learning different, uh, different types of life forms here on Earth. Well, you're taking that and then dealing it in absolutes that science doesn't know. Science hasn't figured it out yet. That's the great thing about science. It's always learning. It's always evolving. That's the best thing about science. And just an I don't know simply says, we haven't figured out the answer yet. And if science was to then come out and not know the answer and say, here it is, then they are getting just as arrogant as the church and every other religion was back in the day. And in some regards, science is doing that. Because I don't see, while I do see some scientists pushing out against certain narratives that are being pushed these days, the fact that people think that they can point to bullshit pseudoscience as being real just shows that science is in some regards letting us down in this category but in my opinion just my stupid opinion anybody who doesn't know the full story who will deal in absolutes is a fool when i'm coming here and i'm defending the fact that there's when it, there are a possibility that other life forms are out there i don't know that for a fact for all i know uh, Prager and this guy is right. There is a God. We are the only life forms for the, all I know. But the, the science doesn't point us in that direction. And also the probability factor doesn't point us in this direction. He's trying to manipulate the probability factor through, as I've already said, using, using what is a probability. He's using it to try and dictate absolution. Even SETI proponents acknowledge the problem. Peter Schenkel wrote in a 2006 piece for Skeptical Inquirer, a magazine that strongly affirms atheism, in light of new findings and insights, we should quietly admit that the early estimates may no longer be tenable. Today, there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every single one of which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. So he says that the early estimates can no longer be tenable. Okay, once again, not proving that God made the universe. Because even if we take the, um, the idea that the Earth is the only planet that can support life, then once again, we're dealing with probabilities. Once again, how many stars, how many planets, how many galaxies? Even if the chances are very small, that life could be supported through the factors necessary, it's, it's going to change once you keep putting planets out there, putting solar systems out there, putting galaxies out there. It's kind of a crapshoot, you know? Think of it almost if you want, um, like the way that life works. What do you, you put, there are about six million uh, sperm that will fight it out to try and get to the egg and only one will get there. So six million sperm failed and one succeeded. And this is sort of the same way you could look at the earth is that by probability, when you have so many stars, so many planets, so many different distances, so many different stars, so many different temperatures, different ozones and climates, one planet, at least one 
had to work out, and that would be Earth. But that does not prove anything about God creating the universe, or the planet Earth, or that we're made in his image. 200 factors? No, 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 no. It does not take 200 factors. Because personally, I've taken a look through and I can't find these 200 factors that you're talking about. I've seen other scientists and scientific magazines talk about the factors necessary, which always seem to be the same, but I can't find these 200 factors. But one thing that has also been theorized is that um, octopuses are not in fact from Earth, that they're so different from any other animal that they're not in fact from Earth. Whether that's true or not, I don't have no fucking idea, but I thought that was a little bit interesting. For example, without a massive gravity-rich planet like Jupiter nearby to draw away asteroids, Earth would be more like an interstellar dartboard than the verdant orb that it is. Hey, that, no arguments here, man. That is absolutely necessary that the gravitational pull of Jupiter does attract a lot of, of um, asteroids and shit and comets. There is no argument from me here. But once again, even with a lot of asteroids striking, that doesn't mean life can't be supported. Life can be supported underground. We don't even know how, how life can be supported deep, how deep into the ground it can be supported by different types of life forms. Simply put, the odds against life in the universe are astonishing. Yet, here we are, not only existing, but talking about existing. What can account for it? So the odds are astronomical, yet here we are existing and talking about existing, therefore there is a god. Great argument, buddy. Can every one of those many parameters have been perfectly met by accident? Absolutely. When you put out 200 billion stars in one galaxy alone, and then you put out another 100 billion galaxies, absolutely those factors can be met by accident. At what point is it fair to admit that it is science itself that suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces? At what point is it fair to admit that it is science itself that suggests that we cannot be the result of random forces. <laughs> is it really that hard to believe in a universe such as ours that we could be by random chance? Is it really that fucking hard to believe when we know this much? Back in the day, I actually could understand if it was that hard to believe because when they thought they were the center of the universe, then it actually may have supported the idea that eh, there was a creator. But that wasn't the case. So is it fair that it cannot be made by random forces? No, because that has not been proven in this video. It has not been proven by the evidence that was presented by our fellow here. Because once again, most of his argument adds up to the fact we haven't made contact and the fact that we haven't through, you know, telescopes seen any contact means that there cannot be a life form, any sort of a life form out there. Even if we haven't made contact with intelligent life form. This to me is a very soft argument because you're letting a lot of things go. You're not, you're letting go again, just how big our universe truly is and a good example of this is if we take a look at this image from the Hubble telescope this image was taken when the Hubble telescope was pointed in one direction for a hundred hours and they just let it record the, every single thing you're seeing out there those are a multitude of galaxies just like our Milky Way think about how big the earth is that is a dust mite in comparison to the galaxy. If I can make a comparison, dust mites are to the Earth what humans are to the universe. And that might even be a wrong comparison because a dust mite might still be bigger in comparison to the Earth than humans are in comparison to the rest of the universe. Now, I'm just going off the numbers that we have in the Milky Way galaxy. But every single one of those beautiful, colorful galaxies hold billions of other stars with billions if not trillions of other planets 
with their own individual unique stars, individual unique planets, in various ways. And to say that not, that all those, because we haven't made contact with them, or we haven't seen evidence from them, are life forms, well again, a lot of times the lack of evidence can point that it's not there. The difference is, is we're trying to look into the whole universe, and somewhere in this huge, huge, huge pile of hay, we're trying to pick out a needle. It's going to take a long time, and it's going to take better technology than what we have available. So is it fair to say that science cannot suggest that we are the result of random forces? No. He says, what point can we admit that? You're going to have to show a lot more evidence than that, buddy. A lot more evidence. Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions in fact require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining Earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds? Not to me. To me, it doesn't, it doesn't seem that incredible that Earth beat the odds because, once again, I feel that some planet somewhere had to beat the odds. And I don't feel like we are the only planet that beat the odds. We had a good factor that led us to develop intelligent life. And I believe that there is other intelligent life out there just based on how big the universe is. But this is the similar arrogance of religion, as he's saying. Like, of course, he's making a religious argument when he says it doesn't make more sense or take, it takes less faith to believe that was made by a creator. Well, no, because then you got to prove where is evidence of this creator. It's not a small argument to make to say that there is an all-powerful, almighty creator out there that controls everything, is in charge of everything, that can't be usurped. This is not a small suggestion. This is a suggestion based on how the universe is formed. You're getting into science's territory there. So prove to me the evidence of a creator and your evidence has to be better than the lack of evidence from science because science has once again said many times it doesn't know or it doesn't know yet but you're trying to say that because science doesn't know now that means that science will never know science cannot know and because of that it's validating your argument even if you could convince me of a reason to to act as if god exists if you could say that without God, there's just this morality problem, you need to believe in God in order to have the earth and people and civilization moving forward morally. Even if you could convince me of that, the lack of evidence for an actual supreme being means that I wouldn't believe in a supreme being. I would believe in the doctrine per se and believe that those rules and morals should be enforced. That doesn't mean that I am, I believe, in an almighty creator. So, so far, at least in this video, what I have seen from this guy is a lot of science doesn't know yet, science hasn't proven it yet, and therefore it's validating my argument of there's a god and the universe was made by creation. But you haven't presented any argument for your side. For actually a religious point of view and saying, here's the evidence of a god and he created the universe, no evidence has been presented. But let's move on. Let him finish. All right, well, let's move on anyway and let him finish up his argument. But wait, there's more. Oh, is it? The fine-tuning necessary for life to exist on a planet is nothing compared with the fine-tuning required for the universe to exist at all. For example, Astrophysicists now know that the values of the four fundamental forces, gravity, the electromagnetic force, and the strong and weak nuclear forces, were determined less than one millionth of a second after the Big Bang. Alter any one of these four values ever so slightly, and the universe as we know it could not exist. Because that's the fabric of the universe. That's the underpinning of the universe that's this is what makes it what it is i <laughs> okay let me see if i can explain it to this guy everything is made up of something you know humans are made up of carbon hydrogen atoms 
everything is made up of atoms. Everything has a fundamental core base, a chemical base, if you will. This would be what we, you can consider the universe's chemical base. Once again, you've proven what something is, but you haven't proven that it's related back to your creator. And he says, how is this decided? Probably because that's what allowed the universe to be what it is today. I don't have the answer for you with that one. But once again, by pointing to this and saying, what is this, is not a valid argument for a deity. For instance, if the ratio between the strong nuclear force and the electromagnetic force had been off by the tiniest fraction of the tiniest inconceivable fraction, then no stars could have formed at all. Yes, that's right. That's absolutely right. There couldn't be stars. There couldn't be existence without them. But there is. See, one thing I've said before, I don't know if I said it on the podcast, but I say in my personal life, it has to do, not even with this, but it has to do with um, why are we here? People say, why are we here? What is the meaning to our existence? I have a really, I'll admit, it is an oversimplification of everything. But for the layman, I find it's a good, a good um, example. People say, why are we here? My answer to this is because if there's not something, there's nothing. And what I mean by this is that we're not here for some grand creative purpose. We weren't here because God put us on each here as an individual and decided that we each have an individual purpose in this world. If this calculation, this chemical composition that the guy is talking about, about the fabric of the universe, if that was off, we wouldn't be here talking about it. But it wasn't off. It was perfect. Holy shit, it just turns out. Because this was what was necessary. This was the mixture, the combination that was required in order to create our universe from this Big Bang. Now, well, I'll be the first one to say, sure, it sounds crazy thinking about that one point our whole universe was smaller than the head of a pin and then explode outward to create this whole giant massive universe that we know. Of course, it sounds crazy. The difference is, unlike telling somebody that there is a God and he created the earth, the only evidence we have for that is the Bible, where science at least has testing and there's things that we can tell about what, there's things that we can tell about the universe. For instance, that the universe is always expanding and there are echoes from the Big Bang. I'm going to admit, I'm not the, uh, I would I rather people look other places than come to me to try and get this information, but just as an example. But I don't hear any echoes of a creator. I don't see any evidence of a creator involved in this. And if you don't believe it's by random chance that we could be here, then why the fuck are so many planets unlivable because despite the fact I talk about there's still a lot of uh, livable planets there's still a shit ton more that are unlivable so it seems to me that this is by combination this is by random chance life uh, 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 finds a way I feel that if it was made by a creator why not make every single one every single planet able to support life why would you put all these extra planets completely inhabitable to me, that almost supports more about the random chance theory than it does made by, made by committee, made by creation theory. But let's move on. Just remember, he's saying that without that proper, uh, the proper combination, no stars could form at all. The universe could not exist. So moving on. Multiply that single parameter by all the other necessary conditions, and the odds against the universe existing are so heart-stoppingly astronomical that the notion that it all just happened defies common sense. Well, I don't personally believe, I don't have the evidence to support it, but I don't believe that it just happened. I think there's some factors, there's some history there that we don't know what it was about. But hey, maybe scientists are wrong in this perspective and the universe has always just been here. That's it. Even though we theorize about how old, old the universe is. Maybe the universe has just always just been here. I mean, that's not my response to that. I'm just adding that in as a possibility. But your argument of think about how crazy that is doesn't doesn't have enough empirical evidence to it to say that it was made by a creator. 
even if let's say in this video he's showing some flaws inside of the Big Bang Theory, he still has not proven about creation. And the problem with creation is that we were made in God's image and with that you have a whole fucking evolutionary theory that you gotta break apart because we have a lot of evidence in there even though people say well it's a flawed theory it's like uh you got a lot of chains to break inside that theory before you can actually say it's a flawed theory so this also doesn't support his argument it would be like tossing a coin and having it come up heads 10 quintillion times in a row i don't think so yeah and guess what that is actually a completely plausible scenario if you do it all the time. Now, if you're just going to say, I'm going to do this once and, once and it's going to turn up heads, then absolutely, you're not going to do that. It's, it's not going to be the odds. You're not going to get it on heads one quintillionth of a time, whatever his, his number was. So if his argument was that we had one planet in the whole universe and this was it, then I absolutely would agree with him. But the fact that we have so many universe, um, so many galaxies, so many planets, then it becomes a real possible scenario, not a plausible one, but a possible scenario. Because the thing about chance is it's like when people say the lottery and they say, don't ever play, you know, zero, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, or whatever, because it's never going to come up. Well, the chances of that number coming up are exactly the same as any other number that are picked. And it's the same sort of scenario in this. While there may be, that might be the number that you have to come up with, when you, when you produce, if you were to try that a quintillion times, but then do that, times that number by 10, you try that, then odds start turning in your favor, which is the same sort of thing you could look at Earth. As more planets and solar system and universes are getting put out that aren't matching up, Eventually, one planet is going to be perfect, and that turns out to be Earth. At least one planet has got to be perfect, because it will beat the odds. Because even if that number, whatever it was, one quintillionth, there's still a shit ton more planets in the universe than that. So suddenly, even though this is a huge number, the odds actually aren't as incredible as they sound. Moving on. Fred Hoyle, the astronomer who coined the term Big Bang, said that his atheism was greatly shaken by these developments. One of the world's most renowned theoretical physicists, Paul Davies, has said that the appearance of design is overwhelming. Even the late Christopher Hitchens, one of atheism's most aggressive proponents, conceded that without question the fine-tuning argument was the most powerful argument of the other side. Hey, I mean, don't get me wrong, on our side, we got a lot of odds to put up with, and we have a lot we don't know of. It's also a lot harder when there's people saying there, well, we know exactly what it is, and this is it. So don't get me wrong. I'm sure there were some shaken feelings about that. I mean, I've had a couple of times my atheism a little shaken just by arguments made about the other side just off the bat because they sound really good. But the thing is, is even though he says this, that doesn't mean that any of these people have actually pertained to this. They said their atheism was shaking. Christopher Hitchens said it was with difficult argument. Once again, does not prove creation. Because maybe I'm crazy on this, but if you're going to, and maybe I'm alone, but if you're going to make a an argument like that about the foundation of the earth, You've got to show empirical evidence that it's that way. Otherwise, your theory doesn't hand up. stand up. Science is at least showing empirical evidence. You are not. You took, essentially, they're taking a theory and saying, well, this, your theory hasn't proved this, which proves my theory. My theory of creationism is proved because science can't explain it yet. Oxford University professor of mathematics, Dr. John Lennox, has said, the more we get to know about our universe, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation of why we are here. The greatest miracle of all time is the universe. It is the miracle of all miracles, one that inescapably points to something or someone beyond itself. This whole miracle thing, saying it's a miracle. You know what a miracle is? It's beating the odds. 
miracle and luck are numbers. That's all they are. They're not some underlying supernatural force. Even though we say things like good luck to each other. I say that too to people, you know, good luck. I hope you do well. What we're saying is we're hoping they do well. We hope they beat the odds. Because in a miracle, what ends up happening is the chances of something happening are so small, but it ended up happening anyway. So this is what a miracle is. It's, it's all about numbers. So once again, when people say that it's a miracle, it is a miracle among miracles. Don't get me wrong, I'll agree with you. But I'm agreeing not that it was a miracle as by some super force. I think it's a miracle because it was astronomical odds that we had to beat. We had astronomical odds to beat. But we did beat them. And we may not be alone. We can't prove it yet. But just because we can't prove it yet doesn't mean that it's not true. Just means we don't know. But again, going back to luck and miracle. When you say good luck to somebody, you just want them to do well. You're not wishing some super force on them. And when someone gets lucky, such as wins the lottery, it's because they've beaten those odds because there were so many people playing the lottery, but they got chosen out of all of them. And that's the same thing with a miracle. If you think once again, if a billion people plays the lottery and only one person wins the lottery, well, technically that's a miracle by chance. The type of like what the chance was of actually winning that for yourself. So that's my other problem with when you say it's a miracle is when he says it's a miracle, he's saying it's some supernatural force. It's some external entity that is assisting that created us when in fact it is just beating the odds. Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of what you point towards does show that it could be difficult sometimes to go against a, the argument of a deity creating the universe because you say, well, shit, like there doesn't seem to be any planets that support intelligent life or even life that we can find. It looks like we may be the only one. But again, I find this is human arrogance because we're saying we don't know, therefore we are sure. At least that's what it seems to me. I'm Eric Metaxas for Prager University. So just to summarize, my problems with this video have to do with the fact that Prager University presented their information in a very biased direction, I would say. I, I won't, don't want to say it's manipulating the evidence, but, well, essentially what they were doing the entire time is just taking the uh taking the evidence the lack thereof of intelligent life that have been found using that to determine that there seems to be no form of life outside of earth and then on top of that well yes it is without a doubt a difficult argument sometimes when we're looking at all the factors i find when you take a much larger look at what the universe is supposed to be like how it's made up then these factors suddenly are minimized. But because of this, because there are these factors that must be achieved by a planet in order to support life, they're trying to present this and say that that is a determining factor for no life. So it seems to me in this argument, instead of it being an argument for God, it's really an argument about whether there's life on other planets. It hasn't really gone to enforce the argument that there is a deity and that we're all by made by creation. But they're trying to insinuate, or at least they're trying to, to correlate uh, a deity and the theory of creationism into the lack of evidence that science has for life on other planets. But when we look at what is available to us on, uh, for information about other planets, it's very limited. All we really can do is theorize based on what we've seen of the solar system of the stars and its planet, whether it can support life. But this is a very low resolution way to look at these planets. We just, while we're going on probabilities right now, it most likely cannot support life. But we're also going on what we know life to be. It's very possible that in a different solar system, there is a different form of life that is not sustainable on Earth. 
again, I'm just going on theories too, and but I find mine, at least at the very least, have more substance to them, because mine are very theoretically possible situations. It doesn't mean that they're true. But this guy is taking the science, and he's trying to correlate it to a completely other theory, in my opinion. So I thought this was not the best work done. Maybe I'm wrong, and if people don't agree with my take on it, then make a comment below and let's see. But right now we're going to turn to other stories. So as I stated, there has been a bit of tension between Washington Post and Project Veritas. Project Veritas, uh, several months ago, led, uh, they it did an expose on CNN where they pretty much exposed that CNN had very little ethical journalism. And they tried this on Washington Post now. They released just a day or two ago, they released the first part of their expose on Washington Post. We have a little bit of it, of it here, and we're going to take a look at it. They don't like Trump, right? Like, I mean, they never know. Don't like Trump. I mean, here's the, here's the thing, though. There's like the there's the news side that's just trying to cover it critically and call bull when they're bull, but also like giving credit where there's credit. You know, like he's yeah. doing something that's good. He's doing more things bad. But he's doing some good things good. Yeah. And then there's like the other side of it that's like you know the opinion from God, like the Washington Post institutional voice, and that's like the editorial. They, those are become like critical to the point where I'll read some of them and I'm like, <laughs> like, I work for this place, like. Democracy dies in darkness, right? I feel like that, man, every time I hear that. Like, we're right on the story. Yeah. So like, you know, like you're spending a lot of emphasis on this or that. Like what? Like, big story. Hurricane Irma. You spent too much time like, on it? Or? Yeah, like, you know, like, there's, like that would be a criticism that you're, you're spending a ton of time on this thing that's sensational versus, you know, like, relevant sort of news, policy like, policy thing that would affect everybody. Like, I can't tell you how many times we get an email and is like, oh, did you see what he just tweeted? What are we going to do about it? The Post tries to rein it in a lot. Uh, New York Times does it less so. Some of the New York Times reporters are way over the top. CNN is always over the top. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Wall Street Journal is very conservative on all that stuff. Some of it's just like the... Who's in charge of your... That was, well, it's what I... Marburger admits Trump is good for business in spite of what the Post's owner and reporters think of him. Like if Trump has disappeared tomorrow, our traffic would drop by 40%. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, we think about that. So as we can see from the video, and if we look back to um, what uh, was presented to us when they did the expose on CNN, they also did one recently on New York Times. If we look and what they've exposed in the media outlet, it has exposed that there seems to be a editorial totalitarianism involved inside these American media corporations. Essentially, people can write the stories, but the editors, the high up people, are playing the uh, are playing God essentially as to what is allowed to be released and what is to be um, what is to either be buried or not released at all. As we can see from the one video, it says how they deliberately try to show the worst uh, the worst news of Trump on the front page. Well, they acknowledge that he has done some things good, but they bury it deep within the different articles that they have available inside their publication. First off, this is showing a lack of journalism ethics, which as we saw from the CNN video that there is no journalism ethics, that all this theory that we hear about that they put out and also that is taught in journalism school is basically a myth that it's all about the clicks, it's all about the views, it's all about how many people you're reaching. Of course, it's a business, don't get me wrong, but it's a little bit different when you're a news corporation. Your whole point is to inform the people. And if you're taking a very biased perspective on that, then you're not doing a good job at informing the people, which is what we can see from this expose on Washington Post, what we can see from the expose on CNN. They typically, from what I can tell, do about four different segments when they're doing the expose um, Project Veritas does. So if we're going by that number, then we can expect to see three more over the next month or so. I think they tend to release them about a week apart. I could be wrong. 
but we'll see more of what they have. As for Washington Post, well, they actually seem to do a good job at figuring out that it was a sting and they managed to buffer it at the very least. My guess is the media, the journalists, were starting to get a little bit wise to what Project Veritas has been doing because it was exposing a few different news organizations showing their lack of ethics. But the one commonality it seems between all these videos, all these news organizations, New York Times, Washington Post, CNN, the one commonality seems to be that the editorial hierarchy is really what uh, decides what gets pushed. And now it depends, it's some are better, some are worse. For instance, CNN is one of the worst ones when it comes to this. But I find that Project Veritas has done a good job at exposing the media for essentially their lack of ethics. This is a ne necessity right now because this is the whole problem with fake news. See, the problem with fake news doesn't have to do so much with the content, with the details. It's what's in force, what's stressed, what bias is there. And that's really the problem a lot of people, especially on the right, have with the mainstream media is that they find that it's, a, it's taken a very left-wing um, um, bias, which is true without a doubt. We just look at all the mainstream media outlets and there's very few conservative ones, both in Canada and America. The media themselves have taken it very personally, of course. They see it as them just trying to undermine the whole news organization the umbrella that encompasses the mainstream media. Project Veritas is just exposing the problems inside the news media. Now, that being said, something did happen that it does appear it came from Project Veritas. It's still not confirmed. But... As Washington Post ends up reporting, as it says here in the Washington Post, a woman approaches the Post with dramatic and false tale about Roy Moore. She appeared to be part of an undercover sting operation. So as we know, there has been a lot of accusations made against Roy Moore. I actually haven't been ta speaking about it at all. I had not taken much notice. I hadn't followed the news much on Roy Moore. But what I do know is that there's been many accusations that have come against them, and many of them were from women who would have been underage at the time when these took place. Now, I've heard some talk that these stories have been starting to unravel or something like that. I have no idea what that's about, and I have no idea if that's true or not. But the point is, is at the moment, Roy Moore is facing accusations of sexual assault of women when they were underage, and he's still going out for, I believe it was the governor? Again, I haven't paid much too much attention to Roy Moore's story. But he is in an election, and he's winning at the moment. He's ahead in the polls. Anyway, it appears that as this Washington Post story breaks it down, the woman, this woman comes up to them and has a story about them and they go into it after she tells her story and she says that she had a sexual relationship with Moore years ago when she was underage and then she uh, got pregnant and he drove her to get an abortion. There were flaws inside the story. It turns out that some of the things she was claiming and some of the things she had said about herself weren't true. So we're actually going to take a look through this article. I hope it doesn't take too long. It was a bit of a long article, but I'll try and get through it as fast as possible. A woman who falsely claimed to the Washington Post that Roy Moore, the Republican U.S. Senate candidate in Alabama, impregnated her as a teenager, appeared to work with the organization that used to deceptive tactics to secretly record conversations in an effort to embarrass its target. In a series of interviews over two weeks, the woman shared a dramatic story about an alleged sexual relationship with Moore in 1992 that led to an abortion when she was 15. During the interview, she repeatedly pressed Post reporters to give their opinions on the effects of her claims would have on Moore's candidacy if she went public. The Post did not publish an article based on her unsubstantiated account. When Post reporters confronted her with inconsistencies in her stories and internet postings that raised doubt about her motivations, she insisted that she was not working with any organization that targets journalists. But on Monday morning, Post reporters saw her walking in the 
uh, into the New York office of Project Veritas, an organization that targets the mainstream news media and left-leaning groups. The organization set up undercover stings that involved using false cover stories and covert video recordings meant to expose what the group says in media bias. James O'Keefe, the Project Veritas founder who was convicted of a misdemeanor in 2010 for using a fake identity to enter a federal building during a previous sting, declined to answer questions about the woman outside the organization's office on Monday morning, shortly after the woman, woman walked inside. I am not going to doing an interview with you right now, so I'm, going, I'm not going to say a word, O'Keefe said. The woman uh, who approached Post reporters, Jamie T. Phillips, did not respond to calls on her cell phone later Monday. Her car remained in Project Veritas parking lot for a, more than an hour. The Post positioned video reporters outside the group's office in Mamarinek, New York, after determining that Phillips lives in Stamford, Connecticut, and realized that the two locations were just 16 miles apart. Two reporters followed her from her home as she drove to the office. After Phillips was observed entering the Project Veritas office, the Post ma made the unusual decision to repost her previous off-the-record comments. Quote, We always honor off-the-record agreements when they're entered in good faith, uh, said Martin Bar Barron, the Post executive editor. But this so-called off-the-record conversation was the essence of a scheme to deceive and embarrass us. The intent by Project Veritas clearly was to publicize the conversation if we fell for the, r the trap. Because of our customary journalist rigor, we aren't fooled and we can't honor an off-the-record agreement if it was solicited in maliciously bad faith. Phillips, Phillips' arrival at the Project Veritas office capped a week-long effort that began only hours after the Post published an article on November 9th that, in 9th that included allegations that Moore once initiated a sexual encounter with a 14-year-old named Leah Korfman. Post reporter Beth Reinhardt, who co-wrote the article about Korfman, received a cryptic email earlier the next morning. Quote, Roy Moore in Alabama. I might know something, but I need to keep myself safe. How do we do this? End quote. The apparent tipster wrote under an account with the name Lindsey James. The email subject line was Roy Moore in Alabama. The sender email address included Roll Tide, the rallying cry for the University of Alabama sports team, which are nicknamed the Crimson Tide. Reinhardt sent an email asking if the person was willing to talk off the record. Quote, I'm not sure if I trust the phone, came the reply. Can we stick just to email? Quote, I need to be confident that we can protect me, uh, you can protect me before I will tell all the person wrote in a subsequent email. I have stuff I've been hiding for a long time, but maybe it should stay that way. The tipster's email came amid counterattacks by Moore's supporter aimed at the Post and its reporters. That same day, Gateway Pundit, a conservative site, spread a false story from a Twitter account, Umpire43, that said, quote, A family friend in Alabama just told my wife that the WAPO reporters named Beth offer her $1,000 to accuse Roy Moore. The, the Twitter account, which was a, has a history of spreading misinformation, has since been deleted. The Post, like many other news organizations, has a strict policy against paying people for information and did not do so in coverage of Moore. On November 14th, a pastor in Alabama said he received a voicemail from a man falsely claiming to be a Post reporter and seeking women, quote, willing to make damaging remarks, end quote, about Moore for money. No one associated with the Post made any such call. In the day that followed the purported tipster initial email, Reinhardt communicated with the woman through an encrypted text messaging service and spoke by phone with the person to set up a meeting. When the woman suggested a meeting in New York, Reinhardt told her she would have to know more about her, her story and her background. The woman offered her real name was Jamie Phillips. <clears throat> the 41-year-old said she had been abused as a child, Reinhardt said. Her family had moved often. She said she moved in with an aunt in the Talladega area of Alabama and started attending a church youth group when she met Moore in 1992, a year he became a county judge. She said she was 15. She said that they started a secret sexual relationship. Quote, I knew it wasn't right, but I didn't care, she said. She said that she got pregnant, that Moore uh, talked her into abortion, and that she drove to Mississippi to get it. In an interview, she told Reinhardt that she was so upset she couldn't finish her salad. Phillips said that she had started thinking about coming forward after the allegations of Hollywood film producer Harvey Weinstein surfaced. Then she said that she, knew, she saw the news about Moore flashing across the television screen while in a break room for her job at a company called NFM Lending in West, uh, Westchester County, New York, Reinhardt said. 
Phillips also repeatedly asked the reporter to guarantee her that Moore would lose the election if she came forward. Reinhardt told her her subsequent text messages that she could not predict what the impact would be. Reinhardt said she also explained to Phillips that she claimed she would be a fact checked. Additionally, Reinhardt asked her for documents that would corroborate or support her story. All righty, right, right, right. So that was the story. Sorry that took a while. Anyway, so as we can see that this was the accusations made. Now, the problem started to arise when she was getting fact checked. One problem was is that there was a GoFundMe page that was set up in her name that was talking about going to work for, um, well, she just said she was going to go work for a news organization that was fighting back against the mainstream media. And I'm sure you can make the, co the correlation here that that could be Project Veritas. Um, also, on top of this, she didn't actually deny that it was her GoFundMe page when she was presented by this uh, later on. So she did confirm, at least more or less, that it was her GoFundMe page and this is what she was doing. On top of that, there was a few smaller information that seemed to be a problem, such as her time period in in uh, her time period in Alabama with the uh, with this guy Roy Moore. So anyway, it seemed very clear that this was actually no, this was a fake story. That this was a fake woman who was trying to get information from Wapo. For me my uh, my alarms would have been going off when she started trying to ask about how it would affect the election. So right now, I'm going on the assumption based on the probability of the evidence, I'm going to say this is actually a woman who is working for Project Veritas that was trying to get more information on Washington Post for this sting operation that they're going to do. And if I happen to be right on that, then I'm absolutely disgusted because this woman faked being a victim of sexual assault in order to uh, try and get information. There's real victims out there. This is not something you should be making up. You shouldn't be making up stories like this because these are serious accusations. And what's even worse about that is because we have just a series of accusations that are coming out now. And on top of that, you're going to put a fake story into the mix? That doesn't help. In fact, along with trying to expose Washington Post for being a certain way, because obviously you're trying to expose that they would post a fake story about Roy Moore to show their bias. The problem is when this comes out too, is because you faked being a victim of sexual assault just to make a point, just to, you know, make these people look bad well then real victims of sexual assault are going to be the ones that pay because of this not you so this is absolutely disgusting if this is actually what took place if it just so happens though that this woman just uh didn't like the way that things were going with talking to the um washington post and she decided to go and check out uh go check out project veritas instead in trying to get essentially uh as tim pool put it he said shopping around with the media if that's what she's doing then okay because then you're just looking for who's going to post the story the way you want it i guess which still maybe not great but if she has a real story to tell fine but it doesn't seem to be this way and this is just a disgusting thing to do to try and fake this just to push your just to make your point the other thing I wanted to point out, though, is in this, um, in this, what Washington Post ended up doing, this, um, this investigative piece. In this investigative piece, I gotta admit, I have not seen an investigative piece this long and this detailed with everything that's happened in a long time from a news organization. They did a good job. They did a very good job. The problem is, is this seems to be the exception. This sort of in-depth investigative journalism is now the exception when it should be the norm. This should be the type of, of groundbreaking journalism that we're seeing, but we're not. Tim Poole was one of the guys I watched to get information on this. As he said on the subject matter, the Washington Post wants to be commemorated for doing the bare minimum. 
this is their job. This is what they're supposed to be doing. Meanwhile, it seems like it's only when people are targeting them that they're willing to put in the time and the effort and whatever resources necessary in order to get the job done. And it's really sad to see if this is the point our investigative journalism has gotten to. But Project Veritas has still promised that more videos will be released. We'll have to wait for them before we can really figure out what's going on. Because if they release more, when, sorry, when they release more videos, this may give more insight into this situation. We'll have to wait and see, but right now I'm disgusted with Project Veritas for faking a sexual assault story, which it may have just been the woman who decided to do that. That may not have been an actual plan or decision from the, um, from Jeff, o James O'Keefe, sorry the uh the creator of project veritas that may not have been his decision or anybody else on his board it may just have been her independent decision but it's a pretty disgusting thing to do if that's what she's doing and on the other hand i'm really it's really sad to see that this is what it takes to get real journalism out of the media sometimes all right moving on to our next story um this whole tax thing that's going on here in Canada, these tax changes built with Bill Moore, no. You know, I, I don't really plan, I haven't planned to be talking about it as much as I have. It's just things keep turning up that become, that are just so relevant. I mean, even though I will see news articles of talking about this, I very rarely hear people that are talking about this unethical practice that is going on. And even it seems sometimes like these stories are trying to be buried, like they're not trying to be in the forefront, that they don't want people to be, you know, overtly aware of how bad things are going. Right now, it seems like the Conservative Party of Canada have really been on the forefront for fighting back against this tax change. But of course, the Liberal, uh, not Liberals, the NDP have also been doing their part. They've also been critical of it. But right now, the Conservatives are the main opposition to the Liberal government, so it makes more sense that they would be taking the reins on this. And one person who has taken it upon himself to really smash the Liberals for their unethical practices is the uh, Conservative finance critic, Pierre Polyev. On Monday, Pierre Polyev really took it to the Liberals concerning this. Actually, more specifically, he really took it to Bill Morneau concerning this uh, his about his involvement with Morno Sheppel, which I've talked about many times on the podcast, this tax change would benefit Bill Morno, or it would have when this was going on. But this has actually even gotten even more interesting as to what Bill Morno has done. We're going to go watch the video in just a second from question period, but it seems Bill Morno may ha be guilty of insider trading. And let's not forget that he is right now under investigation with the um, with the ethics commissioner. So this is taking a very interesting turn. Let's take a look at the video. On December 7th, 2015, the Minister, Minister of Finance introduced a motion in the House of Commons to raise taxes effective January 1st of the forthcoming year. The stock market dropped. Oh. And so did Morno Chappelle oh. by five percentage points. Oh. But not before someone could sell ten million dollars in Morno Chappelle shares oh. one week before that drop and that bill oh. was introduced. Can the minister tell us who sold those shares? Well that's very interesting. Selling his shares just before the market dropped? Hmm. Let's see what he has to say in response to this. Order, order. I'm not sure how a question of who sold shares in a company is a question of responsibility to government. However, I, saw, I see the Minister of Finance is rising. That would have been a shitstorm if the Speaker of the House did not let uh, Bill Morneau answer that question. Which, again, actually he may not have if Bill Morneau hadn't risen for the question. But let's go on. Mr. Speaker, I actually see it as an opportunity to talk about why we did, in fact, uh, raise taxes. 
what we did was we said to Canadians that we thought the appropriate thing to do was to raise taxes on the top 1%. Yeah. And what we said that would enable us to do was to lower taxes on middle-class Canadians. So what we did was we lowered taxes on Canadians, 45,000 90,000 tax bracket, by 7%. It went down from 22% to 20.5%. Thus, what we did, Mr. Speaker, was lowered middle-class taxes on 9 million Canadians. We think this is a really important initiative to ensure tax fairness in our country, and we'll stay on top of that. So, number one, you didn't answer the question. <laughs> uh, number two, he said that they were trying to raise taxes on the top 1%. Well, before the tax changes took place in October, I believe, in September, when all this shit was going down, one of the problems was is who they were targeting. And they were actually targeting about 15% of Canadian companies. That's not going up after the top 1%. So that was wrong. And then even after they made these changes, it's still targeting 2.5% of Canadian businesses. Once again, not going after the top 1%. While they are included, they are also targeting others. So this is wrong right off the bat. And then, number three, you didn't answer the question. The member for Carleton. The Mr. office told John Iveson that he sold 680,000 Morneau Chappelle shares. Whoa. At 1025, on November 30th, 2015, someone sold 680,000 Morneau Chappelle shares. That someone would have saved a half a million dollars by avoiding the drop in the stock market that followed his introduction of tax measures in this House of Commons. So is it just a coincidence that those two transactions line up so carefully? Or in fact, did the minister jump the gun and sell his shares before he introduced his tax measures? Oh, snap. See, that actually would be insider trading. He knew this would be have detrimental effects when he introduced the tax plan, and then it just so happens somebody shall, sold half a million of shares right before? No, 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 no. Too fucking big of a coincidence for it to just be a coincidence. So this is getting interesting because that is actually illegal. That would be illegal to do. It also would show what sort of people the liberals are because I've said before that Justin Trudeau and his kind, you know, they're always saying how how everyone else is unfair to the Canadian people, how all these rich fat cats are the ones that we need to be worried about. While he's doing this, he himself is buddying up to the very people that he's criticizing are the real problem in our society. And this would actually help prove that. So now we're in a very interesting position for the Liberal Party. I think I have a good idea of why members on the opposite side are trying to create conspiracy theories out of thin air. I think their objective is to deflect Canadians from understanding what they don't want them to understand. And that's that the policies that we put in place are making an enormous positive difference for Canadian families. So by introducing the Canada Child Benefit, we're helping 9 out of 10 families do much better. By indexing that, what we're going to see is that we'll keep up with inflation. Mr. Speaker, we're also seeing that we're moving forward with the Working Income Tax Benefit to help working Canadians to get into the middle class. Mr. Speaker, we'll continue on these efforts. Order. That is not a conspiracy theory. Somebody sold those shares. Whether it was Bill Morneau, we don't have actual proof that it was him, but considering how, you know, his name is on the fucking company, it wouldn't be surprising if it was. But he's calling it a conspiracy theory, not a conspiracy theory, because it is proven that somebody sold those shares just before the drop. Now, while it's possible, I don't know for a fact that Morneau Sheppel still has other partners. I think it does, but it's possible it could be one of the other partners who made that, that sale too. But even if that was the case, this would show co some sort of collusion because obviously the person knew that the drop was coming. I mean the tax changes, which would drop the stock market. So they were getting out at least a good chunk of their money before that hit, which would show some form of insider trading. Even if that didn't come specifically from Bill Morneau, even if he was the one that made the transaction, it would still prove that somebody knew it was coming, 
inside Morneau and Sheppel, and they made the transaction. That is still insider trading. I would urge Council Member for Foothills. We all love to hear from when he has the floor to reserve his comments for when he has the floor. Council Member for Carleton. Reading the Liberal platform, one would have expected that that tax increase would take effect at the beginning of the fiscal year. That's when it projected revenues. Instead, in the House of Commons, the minister confirmed that it would take effect at the beginning of the calendar year. Now, investors quickly sold their shares in the 2015 year so that they could realize their gains in a lower taxed year. The markets dropped, Morto Chappelle dropped by 5%, but not before someone who knew what was going on was able to sell his shares and save a half a million dollars. Wow. Who was that somebody? Who was that? <laughs> And before Bill Morneau even answers again, um, I also want to say, because I have a feeling I know what's coming, uh, and he already did it in his last answer, and he's doing a classic Trudeau tactic, which is that you deflect the question, which is funny because he accused the conservatives of doing that. You deflect the question and then focus on something else that you're doing well at. In their case, it was the child benefit plan that they wanted focused on. Because that is something that actually is benefiting Canadians. The thing is, though, is that's one thing they have, but they don't have much else. And the whole point is, of a opposition is to point out the flaws of a government. So they're actually doing pretty well. And Bill Moore no whining about how the conservatives are not focusing on what the liberals are doing well is not really an argument. It's just you whining about it. But in the end, he's never answered the question. This is going to be the third time they're going to ask him the exact same question. Who sold that shares? And of course, they're saying that Bill Morneau sold the shares without directly saying it. They're accusing him of selling the shares. But he still has not answered the question. He still hasn't even given an I don't know. Let's see what his third answer is. I have a good feeling I know where this is going. Once again, it is not clear that this is within the responsibility of the government. And as I see no one rising to answer, no member for Carleton. Well, it is actually the responsibility of government to ensure that no minister ever uses inside knowledge yes. to benefit from transactions on they the stock market, exactly. Mr. Speaker. And we know that when this member locked in stone changes to the tax system, that would raise capital gains tax, investors quickly sold so that they could make their gains before those changes took effect. The stock market dropped as a result. Morto Chappelle went down 5%. But somebody sold $10 million in shares before that could happen. Somebody sold those shares before the minister introduced his measures on the floor of the House of Commons. Was that this minister? Okay, now we're getting to the third answer. But he even had to be more direct. Was it this guy? Did this guy make the, the sell the shares? Let's see the answer. Judges say. I'm happy to answer for the fact that as Minister of Finance, I'm looking to make sure that our economy does well. Of course, one of the ramifications of that is positive. Order. We all need. I need to hear the answer. Members need to hear the answer. We need to know whether someone says something is out of order, or would members before we went on something else? Order. Now, the Minister of Finance has the floor. As as one of the uh, things that the finance minister does, we work to make sure that the economy is doing well. What's happened over the last couple of years is the economy's done well. Of course, one of the positive upsides of that is sometimes the stock market does well as well. Of course, the stock market is significantly up from when we came into office. Mr. Speaker, we're working on behalf of middle-class Canadians, trying to help Canadians to get in the middle class. The good news is those efforts are working. Canadians are seeing the benefit. In the same time, we're seeing advantages across the economy. And I have the honourable member for Louis City. We're just never going to get an answer out of any Liberals, are we? So we skip a little bit ahead now, and then we're going to get back to Pierre Polyev's question. Pape, the famous financial expert, wrote in the Globe and Mail after 
the minister's uh, tax increase which was introduced on the floor of the House of Commons. If you've been considering taking profits on some of your stocks, do it now. You'll save the equivalent <laughs> of 2 percent federal tax plus the provincial share. As a result, many sold their shares, and the stock market dropped. Morneau Chappelle dropped 5 percent. Oh. But a week before the minister introduced his measures on the floor of the House of Commons, someone sold $10 million of Morneau Chappelle shares. Was it him? Was it him? Yeah. Our Minister of Finance. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I will continue to advocate on behalf of the tax system. What we did, Mr. Speaker, was something that we believe was absolutely the right thing to do. We did raise taxes on the top 1%, including families like mine. Order, 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 order. I really would encourage members not to interrupt and don't have the floor. They know that standing order 18 prohibits it. And so I'd ask my honorable friend from Cypress Hills Grasslands and others and others not to interrupt. When it's not their turn, wait for their turn. That's not that much to ask. I think members can manage it. The Honourable Minister of Finance has the floor. As I said, Mr. Speaker, we were very pleased to move forward on a package of tax changes that made an enormous difference on 9 million Canadians. Lowering taxes on middle class Canadians was financed by raising taxes on the top 1%. We saw that as a way All to right. make sure that our tax system was more fair. And we have continued down that path by looking at additional tax changes this past summer, lowering small business tax rates, finding some advantages for the wealthy. All right, all right, enough of that. So as we can see, we're not getting any answers out of this, but Pierre Polyev really hit him hard during Monday's question period, and he came back at him again on Tuesday. I don't have any video of that for you, but he ended up hitting him again, and it's gotten to the point where Bill Morneau is now threatening legal action if they keep pushing this narrative. So as we can see from this CTV News article, it says, Finance Minister Bill Morneau is threatening to sue the Conservatives for suggesting he use his inside knowledge of a pending tax change announcement in 2015 to sell off stocks before their value dropped. On Tuesday, a day after sidestepping more than a dozen questions on the issue, Morneau called the insinuation by Tory finance critic Pierre Polyev absurd. Quote, if the opposition wants to continue these absurd allegations, which have no basis in any sort of fact, they take them outside of the House, then take them outside of the House of Commons and I will... Give them a sense of exactly how our legal system works, said Morneau. Anything said in the House of Commons is subject to parliamentary, parliamentary privilege, which gives MPs legal protection from libel and defamation laws. Polyev first raised the allegations Monday during question period in the House of Commons. It's funny. To me, Morneau says that there's absolutely no basis in these allegations. If that was true, then what are you afraid of, bud? Why are you so worried? Why won't you answer the questions? This should be a very simple, it was not me. No, I did not sell those shares. But I feel like one of the reasons he can't actually say full out no is because if something was to come back to him, then he can deflect and say, well, I never said no. But the thing is, and he's said before that he's been 100% open with the ethics commissioner when he hasn't. We knew he had involvement with Shepard and more no, I mean. but. He made, there was this sale that happened, and then a lot of people got mad when it turns out that Morneau and Sheppel would benefit from the tax change, too. When it turns out that Morneau and Sheppel could get more business out of this tax change, he sold off more shares. Because, he, as again, I've talked about it before, he was trying, it seemed like he was trying to do a PR stunt. And then when this still was enough, he sold off the rest of the shares. Now it just seems for sure that he's trying to get rid of as much evidence as possible. And when all these came to light and he sells off his shares, now he turns around and says that he's been honest from the start. He has never been honest with us. This has been, um, there's just too much evidence pointing to that he, there is malpractice being taken by Bill Morneau and Justin Trudeau and the rest of the liberals, but they're doing absolutely everything to defend Morneau. I hope that this does go to trial so that way we can get a real investigation into what's going on because to me the evidence just seems to point at Bill Morneau as being guilty in some way and let's not forget that there was a lot of uh, 
there during the Paradise Papers release, there was a lot of information that was showing that the liberal government had rich, uh, rich billionaires and millionaires that were on their side, but then were also moving money offshore. So to think that Bill Morneau, who himself is very rich, is one of the ethical ones inside the liberal government? No way. No way. He's just as bad as the rest of them. And to prove it is you just need to watch the video that I just showed you. He deflected the way Trudeau would deflect. Just as much. Just as well. So I see no reason to trust anything Bill Morneau says. And I hope, I really hope that this does go to some sort of trial or something like that. And I hope he gets fried. Because now, if there's actually a trial, we can look into it. We can actually look more into Morneau and Sheppel records and see who the fuck sold those shares. And if it turns out it was Bill Morneau, then there's insider trading. And if it turns out it was someone close to Bill Morneau, one of his partners or something like that, it also would help show insider trading. So things are just getting heated up in the House of Commons. And I really hope that the Conservative Party really keeps taking it to Morneau and the rest of the Liberals to get down deep and figure out what's really going on with our finance minister and the rest of the rich fat cats that surround Trio and the Liberals. I want to thank you for joining me on the podcast today. I'm Adrian Lloyd. This is Just My Stupid Opinion. I'll see you guys soon.